Open them, if you would, <clears throat> to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 27. The title of our message this morning is, Which Race to Run? Also, just a side note, in midweek service on Wednesdays, we finished the Old Testament. So now, on Wednesdays, we're going to be picking up the verse by verse, chapter by chapter, also through 1 Corinthians. And on Sunday morning, we're going to find a section and dive in deeper. So just to let you see, as we transition into a new uh, approach, uh, which we've done for many years uh, in going through the Word of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning, your word that ministers life. And God, we just pray that you would take our hearts and just transform them because your Holy Spirit has just brought truth, life, love, the Holy Spirit ministering to us. God, transform us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in this section uh, in 1 Corinthians where Paul is answering questions that they have sent to him. Remember now, he's already sent one letter to them. We don't have that one, but they've responded with questions. And uh, he gives answers, questions about um, marriage. Last uh, week we looked at that. Uh, sexuality in marriage, very interesting. Wisdom about being single. They ask questions about uh, freedom in Christ, liberty, you know, can we do this, can we do that? Uh, particularly, can we eat meat sacrificed to idols? After all, they said, you know, idols are really nothing. And, uh, you know, you look at that and you wonder, is there any relevance, you know, today with some of those questions? And absolutely there is. Now, it's true. You're not going to go to Fred Meyer and find prime rib on sale because it was sacrificed to Zeus. That's true. But there is such application to our lives that we were looking at. So it's really important. But the idea of can I do this and can I do that is really very self-focused. And so he's really bringing a higher perspective. And he says, now listen, you, you know that idols are nothing. Great, that's knowledge. Knowledge gives you freedom. That's great. But your knowledge is also making you insensitive and puffing you up. And I want to show you something far yet better. How about love? Love builds people up around you, and it's just a better way to live. See, all of these questions really have to do with the greater question. How are you going to live your life? Are there a, is there a principle, a higher principle that will guide how you live your life? In chapter 8, there's a verse that says, there is, one but, there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him. There's another part of that that says there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. We live and move and have our being through him, and he has given us life. We exist for him, and that's what gives that meaning, that purpose, that significance to our lives. Let's live our lives for the glory of God. See, the point he's making is that there are many different ways a person can live their lives today. You get to choose. There's all kinds of ways you can live your life. And the same was true in, uh, in Corinth. My goodness, the, the temple of Aphrodite was right there in the city of Corinth. If, if they so chose, they could have lived their lives by pursuing the desires of the flesh, and many did. He said, listen, you, look at the world we're living in. You can choose a lot of things. You get to choose how you're going to live. You get to choose whom you're going to serve. You get to choose the race you're going to run. Wouldn't it be sad? Wouldn't it be sad, you come to the end of your life and you realized you climbed the wrong ladder, you ran the wrong race, you pursued the wrong goal, you desired the wrong prize. That's the point that Paul's bringing us to in these, in these verses in chapter 9. He uses an analogy of running a race. Run the right race, pursue the right goal. How are you going to live how are you going to run? What are you pursuing? What prize are you longing for? Now, the church at Corinth would have really totally understood that analogy of running a race. Because the games, of course, this is Greece, right? So the games were so important. Not just the Olympic games, but the Isthmus games right there in Corinth were, 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 were only second to the Olympic games in size and stature. And so this was significant. We love sports. 
And I think Paul loved sports. He was really using a lot of the sports analogies. You know, we love watching football and the NFL and the NBA. We follow and track what team is drafted so-and-so and traded for who and who's going to be serving. Everybody's shuffling now. And we're all wondering, you know, how this next season is going to go. And the Blazers look like they're in big trouble because they've traded their big guys. And, oh, my, what are we going to do? And, you know, we focus on these seasons. We like sports. Well, they didn't have that, but they had the games. And it was very significant, very important. The winner of the, the most significant race, which was called the Stadium, was a 630-foot straight uh, uh, sprint. The winner of that race would have his name over the Olympiad for that four years. It would be marking their calendar. Back in those days, it was so significant that someone might say, oh, you know what year that was? That was the year that so-and-so won the Stadium. Oh, yeah, that year. I remember that. And they, they marked their calendars. It was so important. The race, the winner of that race was like a hero. There's no second, no third. It's like winner and that's it. So they totally understood this analogy. And it has a spiritual bearing on our lives. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain the prize. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Now, they do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, an imperishable, an eternal, spiritual in nature and value. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not, as not beating the air. In other words, he's got purpose and meaning and direction I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I've preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. These are really important. He's touching on the deepest questions of life. And so the point that we need to grasp that he's pressing into us, run for the right prize. Let's start with that. Run in such a way that you may obtain the prize. Those who ran in the games received an imperishable wreath. That was their, their uh, in, indication of winning. They didn't have gold medals. They had an olive wreath. And uh, they would cut these branches from the wild olive tree that grew next to the temple of Zeus. They would cut it with golden scissors and uh, knit it or formed together by so-and-so and, -so and either into a circle or a horseshoe. Nevertheless, it's just... An olive wreath, and it's perishable. You know, the guy takes it home, no doubt puts it on his wall. He wants everybody to see it as they come in, you know. It's the wreath. I want it in the stadium. But after a while, don't you think his wife would say, look, it's dead. Get rid of it. It's just a bunch of dead leaves on the wall. At some point, it's a perishable wreath. He says, what wreath are you running for? We? Imperishable. You know, there's a saying, kind of a common phrase in the world, he who dies with the most toys wins. Well, frankly, that's not much of a win. That's the whole purpose and meaning and direction of your life. That's not much of a win. God says, let me tell you the value. The value is the soul. That's eternal. All the stuff of this world is passing away. And the world itself is passing away. But the soul is of greater value. And the souls of those around you have greater value. Here's a verse from Jesus in Matthew 16, 26. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? How would that profit you? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Many do not recognize the value of what God has given them. The value of their soul. God knows it. God sees it. They don't see the value of their soul. And their, that value is what determines the race you're going to run. That value, seeing that, determines how you're going to live your life. And in fact, he says, and to see the value of those around you. Many live very self-focused. See the value of those around you. In other words, love is a great way to run. Run this race. And love, in other words, it's how you live your life. Love is a great way to run. Chapters 8 and 9, he makes the point. Listen, there's a principle that's higher. Can we do this? Can we do that? Should we do this? Should we do that? 
listen, that's all self-focused. Love is higher. Love builds up. In fact, you're very near it. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13. It's the famous chapter on love. But let's just look at the first few verses. He says, if I, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but don't have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That's how, that's how worthless that is. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith so as to remove mountains but don't have love, I am nothing. Hmm. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I deliver my body to be burned but don't have love, it profits me nothing. Love is the determiner of value. It's a great way to live. It's a great way to run this race. It's a great quality as you walk your way, as you run this race of life. You know, uh, on July 4th, we went to the July 4th uh, parade. Uh, our, our granddaughter, Avia, uh, had said, you know, my mom always took me there. I want to go, so let's go. So we go to the July 4th parade. And if you know the parade today, the thing in parades now is to throw candy. When I was going out, we didn't get candy when we were in the parade. But they throw candy now. And, uh, of course, so all the kids are out by the curb. And so the candy gets thrown, and everybody starts clamoring, you know, to grab the candy. So I'm kind of standing back, and I'm, I'm, I'm watching, and, you know, she's got a bag. And, and so she's, you know, the candy gets thrown, and she starts grabbing some and putting them in her bag. And more candy gets thrown. And I see that there's a couple of kids, one on one side, one on the other, that are younger than she. And they can't get out there and get like the rest of them. I'm just kind of watching her. And I was so touched because she started giving candy to them. Like getting some and making sure this one had some and giving sure that one here. And the mom of one of them actually said to her, that's very sweet of you. Kind of looked up at me and smiled. And I thought, Avian, never lose that. That's the way to live your life right there. See the value of those around you? Paul, he says something that really catches our attention. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, he's talking about, you know, whether I can eat food sacrificed to idols, da, da, da. He says, listen, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat food again. Oh, excuse me, ever eat, never eat meat again. I gotta eat food. That I might not cause my brother to stumble. Love is more important. Love is more important than my freedoms. Love is more important than my freedoms. 1 Corinthians 9, 22. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That's a powerful verse. How about verse 23 of this same chapter? Where he says, And I do all things for the sake of the gospel that I might become a fellow partaker of it. Why such dedication? Why such heart? Why, why such the, the, the commitment of the soul, why dedication? Answer, because God has done so much for him. Faith is foremost because love is foremost. Oh, if you know Paul's story, oh, what God did for him. Oh, did God redeem a, a man that was really far gone. Oh, had he messed up his life and God took a, took a hold of him and brought him. Oh, do you remember that love that you had? Remember the love that you had when you first came to faith in Christ? Remember the day that you received Christ and the joy, the zeal, the excitement? God remembers. He says, keep the love that you had at first. I was talking this week to Pastor Samuel, our Beaverton campus pastor. And he's mentoring and ministering to this guy who, who has just come to faith in Christ. And, and he's got all this excitement and joy and zeal. And, and he wants his wife to come to the Lord. And he's just excited about the whole thing. And I thought, man, that is, that is so refreshing to see again and again that newness and freshness of that first joy and that first love. You remember that? He says, I want you to have that same love. Run that way. Run that way. Love. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love, it's a great way to run. God says, I remember. I remember the love that you had at the first. I love this verse in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. It gives us that perspective. 
God says, oh, I remember. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. What a picture. And then he gives back to 1 Corinthians 9. He's helping us to see the involvement of the heart. In other words, don't be a spectator. He says, run in such a way that you obtain the prize. In other words, run. Get in the race, run. Set your heart, set your mind. Focus on that prize, that goal. Run, don't be a spectator. Don't sit on the sidelines. Put your heart all in this. Don't just stand back. Don't just be an a, a, a observer watching. Jump in with all of your heart. Think of all that he's done for you. Man, if you've received Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior, you're already involved. His blood has been applied to you. The forgiveness of sin has been given to you. He's adopted you as a son or as a daughter. He's your father now. You're pretty involved now. So jump in with all your heart. Live to the fullest. See, some people stand back and observe. Well, that's very interesting. They watch the church. They watch Christians. So this is a very interesting thing. They're just observing. Don't just be an observer. Jump in with all of your heart. I love the challenge that Joshua gave in Joshua 24, verse 15. This challenge rings through the centuries and rings right into our hearts. Choose. There's lots of ways you can live your life today. There's a lot of choices. There's a lot of ways you can live. He says, I challenge you. Choose. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served beyond the river or the gods of the people in the land in which you are now living. But as for me and my house, we've made our mind. We will serve the Lord. We've set our course. We've determined with our heart. See, in other words, Christianity is not something to be sampled. It's not something to be nibbled. You know that verse that says, taste and see that the Lord is good? Let's not nibble and see that the verse is good. It's partake fully and you will see that the Lord is good, that the favor is on you. In other words, pour your heart into this thing. Jump in with all your heart. That's a great way to live your life, a great way to run the race. Hey, when it comes to parenting, I'm in with all of my heart. When it comes to being a grandparent, I'm in with all of my heart. There's some things you just got to jump all the way into. You know, we go to the lake and... Uh, you know, no matter how uh, warm it is, that water always seems cold at first, right? And some people, you know, get in one way. Some get in another way. Some people kind of dabble. Oh, it's too cold. It's, you know, wait a minute. That's not the way to get in the lake. We bring our grandson. He's three. Come on, Ethan. Jump in. Get in. Oh, no, it's too cold. That's not the way to get in. I love the way Avia gets in. Jumps right in. They're full in all the way, right out of the bat. That's the way to live your life in Christ. Your heart is fully in. I love that perspective. I'm in with all of my heart. How are you going to run this race? There's lots of things, lots of choices you can make today. Don't be a spectator. Don't be on the sides. Don't be an observer. That's interesting. No, he says, love. The first, the highest, the foremost of all things that God has ever said, Jesus quoted, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor. Love your brother. Love is a great way to run. But then he's telling us this picture. He uses the analogy of running a race. And he's run with endurance. Oh, this is a race that lasts a lifetime. This is not a little sprint. This is a lifetime run. He says, I run, verse 26, in such a way as not without aim. I don't run without aim. I'm not just meandering here and there through life. I have fixed my heart. I have determined my course. I have decided to follow Jesus, and there's no turning back. No turning back. I'm in. I'm in with all of my heart, and there's no turning back. He's got purpose. He's got direction. His eyes are fixed. His heart is determined. I love Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. He uses a similar analogy. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles. And let's, let's run the race with endurance, this race that's set before us, 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We began in Christ. We're going to stay in Christ. We're going to cross that finish line in Christ. I have set my course. I have determined my heart. He says, run this race with endurance. Fixing your eyes, setting your course, determining your heart. You know, when I graduated from Bible college, I had the privilege of giving the valedictorian speech, and those were the very verses I spoke on. There we were graduating, all you know, young, full of hope, full of vigor, full of idealism. What a great message for us to all take hold of, and me as well. Fix your eyes, man. Determine your course. Set the direction of your life and stay the course. Steadfastness. Run with endurance. But he says in, back in Hebrews 12, to run with endurance means to set aside encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles. It's a really good picture. Sin which so easily entangles. It's kind of a picture of uh, briars. We get briars. We live in the Northwest where we got these blackberry things with these canes, with these you know, thorns on them, and you get messed up with that. They will take hold of you and tear your legs. I was going up in the country, and man, those things just take over everything. Imagine running a race, and the path goes along you know, a bunch of uh, those blackberry things. Stay away. You run on the other side because you get anywhere near those things and once they get a hold of you, they start tearing you and tearing you and pulling you down. It's a great picture of how many people live their lives with too much encumbrance and stuff that entangles. You can't run that way. Pulls you down. You know, one of the most grueling races, speaking of the uh, races in Greece, they actually had a race where the competitors would be dressed in full military armor and then run the race that way. It would almost be humorous to watch because it's so encumbering, so difficult to run with all of this stuff pulling you down. What's well, a great picture? See, it's a great picture. Many people run with so much baggage. They're loaded with encumbrance. They're holding on to things. You know one of the heaviest things that people carry? I'm convinced. Bitterness. Unforgiveness. Things have hurt. We all understand hurt. We all understand wounds. But he's saying, don't you see? They encumber you. I want you to run with the joy. The joy of the Lord, man. L run the race with the peace that passes understanding. Run the race with a love that's free and clear. Encumbered? No, let go of these things. Let go of these things. Let go of these things. They're encumbering you down. Forgive. Let go. Let go. Forgive. It's holding you back. You can't love in the fullness of love when you're encumbered by unforgiveness. In fact, in Hebrews 12, same chapter but a few verses later, he says, see to it. See to it, that no one comes short of the grace of God. Now, that right there is really powerful. He says, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. It causes trouble in your life, and by it many are defiled. They end up bitter. And you can't love when you're bitter. You can't have joy when you're bitter. You don't have peace when you're bitter. Jesus said something interesting. In Luke chapter 8, verses 14 to 15, he's teaching a parable. And it had to do with a, a, a farmer sowing his seed. It's a picture of the word of God being sown. And he said, now there are different types of soils, like there are different kinds of hearts that receive the word. There's the hard heart. The word is sown. It's hard. doesn't receive a word of it. And the enemy just snatches it up. There's others who have soil, but it's thin. There's rocks. And the, it can't take root. They hear the word. They do hear it. They receive it. But as soon as the heat of the day comes, they're offended. And it bears no fruit. Withers and dies. And then in Luke 8, he gives us another picture. He says, now the seed which fell among the thorns. Now these are the ones who have heard. But as they go their way, what does that mean? It means as they live their life, as they run their race, they're choked with worries, Riches, pleasures of this life, and they bear no fruit to maturity. 
But there's another kind. Uh, but the seed that fell on the good soil. These are the ones who've heard the word and they've heard it in an honest and good heart. And they hold on to it. They hold it fast. And they bear fruit with perseverance. They bring a spiritual result in their lives. What a better way to live. And he says, the, those worries, those pleasures and riches, they choke. In other words, you're holding on. They're encumbering you. They're holding you down. What a picture of the encumbering that many people have in their lives. He said, run this race without all those encumbrances. Let it go. To quote the famous philosopher from Arendelle, Queen Elsa, let it go. Okay, I'm not going to sing that. <laughs> but turn away and slam the door is actually a pretty good point. And so then he goes in, in the next verses, and he's telling us, here's a spiritual application. Exercise self-control in all things. Notice verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Now, they do it to receive a perishable prize. But we, imperishable, eternal, spiritual. An athlete must use self-control in what they eat, the regimen of their training, even the focus of their mind. Now, he's using the spiritual point. I want you to live victoriously. I want you to run this race. I don't want you to be victorious in it. I want you to have the blessing and favor of God all over it. So I'm wanting you to see the point. The, the athlete, he trains. He uses self-control in all things. What he eats, of course. The regimen of training. Even the focus of his mind, which reminds me of 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Renew your mind, he says. Keep sober in spirit. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Pin your hope on this. Fix your eyes on this. So the analogy is spiritual. He says, I want you to be victorious. It's just like an athlete uses self-control. What they eat, you need, we need good spiritual food. You have to admit with me that an athlete would not compete well on the typical American junk food diet. Would that not be true? I mean, the, the typical American junk food diet is not going to do it for an athlete. They're going to have to have more discipline on what they eat. They're disciplined because they know that they're, they're fueling the body and they have to discipline so they can have the strength, the endurance. It's a good spiritual analogy. Because frankly, there's a lot of spiritual junk food all around us. There's a lot of ways you can live your life today. There's a lot of choices. You get to choose. And that's why he's challenging us. There's spiritual junk food all around us. But there's also spiritual food that endures to eternal life. That which is good. And the scripture uses that analogy of what we eat physically to what we receive spiritually. It connects the two together in many places. For example, when Jesus was coming... To the end of a 40-day fast. Remember, as he was just beginning his ministry, he went into the desert and had a 40-day fast. At the end of which, the enemy, Satan, had come and tempted him. And he said, if you're the son of God, literally, since you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread, knowing that he would be hungry at this point. You're hungry. I know that you physically want to eat. So turn the stone into bread, since you're the son of God. Jesus responded, Matthew 4.4. 4, it is written, I love the way Jesus answers with Scripture and the authority of God's Word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I just love that answer. There's just a powerful response. Physical being is of little consequence in comparison to your spiritual being. Because even this body of ours is temporary. We're just living in a temporary tent. And the older you get, the more temporary you realize it is. The spiritual nature of it is the significance. There is another uh, uh, point that he brings, an analogy. This is in John 4. And this is where Jesus comes up to this well. And there's a woman. And he says, give me a drink. And the woman says, how is it? That you, being a Jew, ask of me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink. 
And they get into this conversation. And he brings to her attention the comparison between that water and the living water. The Spirit he begins to speak about life. More significant issues of eternal life. And at one point he says to her, go get your husband. She says, I, I, I have no husband. And he said, you have said it correctly that you have no husband. Because you had four husbands. And the man you're now with is not your husband. She said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. He touches on the deepest issues of life. He touches on the things which matter. And brought her to life. And brought her to the knowledge of salvation, which she received. And then she went into the village, and you said, you got to hear this man who has spoken all things to me. And revealed all that I've done. That got their attention. Let's go see him. Meanwhile, the, 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 the disciples say, to Jesus, sir, take some food. And I love what he says in John 4, verse 32 to 34. Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You think about that verse? That's powerful. Oh, you, I have food that you do not know. See, the analogy between the physical bearing of this world and the spiritual, reality, the spiritual reality that it pictures is far greater. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, he says, this is an analogy of running the race. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control. Spiritually, we need self-control. Now, a lot of people, when they hear that idea, they're like, oh, pastor, I don't want to hear about self-control. I don't like the idea of self-control. Well, we're going to have a message today, and the message, part of the subtitle is going to be exercise self-control. Groan. We don't like the idea of self-control because many people like to live in the moment. They like to do what they wish at the moment. Many people eat that way. He's using the analogy. We can use it too. Many people eat whatever they feel at the moment. Many people are very at-the-moment eaters. You know what I mean? They feel like eating this, so that's what they eat. Without thinking through, of course, that these eventually are going to have consequences. It's like comfort food. Makes a person feel better at the moment by little by little. Makes them feel worse. Actually, there was a study. Who does all these studies? I don't know. But there's a study. And the question was, does comfort food actually accomplish the goal of comfort? The answer is, actually, no. The study revealed that instead of feeling comfort people actually felt guilty because they knew that what they were eating was actually not going to help them and eventually would result in a muffin top. So they realized that this is not helping them at all. So the comfort food didn't bring comfort. Is there a spiritual equivalent? Yes, there is. There absolutely is. Because many people seek comfort of the soul. And they have pain, excruciating loneliness, despair, hopelessness, emptiness. And they, they, they seek some kind of comfort for it. So they end up medicating their pain with that which is actually poison. And instead of feeling better, they feel worse. Medicating with alcohol or drugs or sexual things. There's so many things today that, that are like spiritual, they think, or comfort, but actually are hurtful and harmful to the soul. They don't bring help. So that's why, that's why God's word is so relevant today. Because he speaks of the deepest points of our loneliness, our despair, our emptiness, our pain, our hurts. And he says, don't you see? I want to show you a better way to run, a better way to live. I want you to have love. I want you to have a peace that passes understanding. I want you to have a joy. That's just way better. I want to heal the hurt. I want to 
I want to touch the loneliness. I want you to understand my love for you. If you could only comprehend it. You would long for it because it satisfies the soul. I love Psalm 42, verses 1 to 2. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs, pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Thirst, hunger, these are desires. He says, I know you have desires. Every soul does. And the deepest desires, God wants to touch and answer and heal. So he's bringing the point. Run this race like an athlete would bring self-discipline. I want you to be victorious. You need to see this point. He says, now discipline your body. It's not the master. Notice verse 27. I buffet my body and I make it my slave. Now that word buffet is not the word buffet. <laughs> that is the word buffet. And it means, it's a Greek word that literally means to bring it into submission. It's like a wrestling a uh, word. I hold, I bring it into submission. My body is not going to be the master. Because you know it wants to. He's touching, again, on the deepest issues of life. You know your body, your flesh, wants to be the master. I want to see what we're going to eat. I want to see where we're going to go. I want to see what we're going to watch. I want to see what we're going to listen to. I want to see what we're going to do in this life. I want to be the boss. It was like a child. I want what I want and when I want it. That's the flesh. Paul says, it's not going to be the master. That is going to end badly. It's kind of funny. We were having a conversation with our granddaughter, Via. I'm so glad we have a Via. It's a whole new source of fresh sermon illustrations. It's great. <laughs> we're talking to Via about, you know, respecting, you know, your, uh, your adults, you're respecting your grandparents, respecting the word. And she said, why can't kids be the boss? What a great question. Well, there's a reason. Because that will end badly. I had several conversations with my kids. So why is it that you want to do that thing? Whatever, and they explained it. And I said, that's why right there you need a parent. Because that's going to end badly. And he says the same thing. Paul's recognizing it right away. Now, listen, I'm going to... Buffet my body. I want to make it my slave. I'm going to put it into submission. It's not the boss. It can't be the master. That's going to end ruinously. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, he says, okay, all things are lawful for me, using a phrase that they quoted to him. Okay, fine. But I will not be mastered by anything. Nothing will master me. Food for the stomach, stomach for food. God will do away with both of them, frankly. They're temporary. The body's not for immorality. God didn't give you a body for immorality. God gave you a body for the Lord. And the Lord's for you. The Lord's for the body. Nothing will master me. I love, I love the picture. I will not be mastered. That flesh, it's ruinous. You let it be the master, it's ruinous. He says, no, I will be. I will bring it into submission. An athlete who competes must discipline his body. Same point. He presses on when he doesn't feel like it. But it's a spiritual analogy. It's a spiritual point. You know, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, he uses that idea of physical exercise and physical strength, etc., to make a spiritual point. He brings these words. Bodily discipline is only a little profit. Now, is bodily discipline of profit? Yes. If you work out, you should work out. As we get older, the older we get, the more we should work out. I mean, we need to work out as we get older. Amen? <laughs> that was not a very exciting amen right there. But isn't it true? I'm, I mean, we should. It's good. It, it is some profit. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You should take care of your body. You should eat right and you should exercise. Amen? And I believe in that, right? So, and I, I go down to the gym. I like to work out. But you know, it's kind of fun. You go down there and you see some of these guys, right? And the, of course, they have to wear their shirts like this so they can. I guess. And I, and I think, and some of these guys are like, boom, boom, boom. And I think, how long you been doing this, man? How many hours? I thought, you know, imagine, just imagine. 
Just imagine if a person had that kind of discipline spiritually. What if a person had that kind of application of self-discipline spiritually? Spiritual food, the regiment of the discipline of what they do in the word and their relationship to the Lord, the focus of their heart and their life. Imagine the faith they would have. Imagine the blessing that they could bring to those around them, the love that they would have, the maturity in Christ. Can you imagine? He says, bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness, ah, that's profitable for all things, since it holds promise for this present life and for the life to come. It'll bless your life now, and it has eternal bearing. In other words, how you live matters. You get to choose whom you will serve. You get to choose the race you will run. You get to choose the prize that you seek, that which is eternal and imperishable that's offered to us in Christ. There's a lot of ways you can live your life today. There's a lot of ways you can live your life. Choose, he says, this day, whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word that touches us, transforms us, brings us to see that victory which you have for us. And I pray for everyone in this room, oh God, that you would begin to just move on us by the Holy Spirit. There are so many ways to live, and you have offered us life. At the same time, you say, I want you to choose life. I want you to choose to run to the glory of God, the honor of the King. There's a lot of ways to live. I want you to live this way because it is the way that will bless your life. Maybe you're running with encumbrance, things holding you down. Maybe you'd say to the Lord, God, I want to be free. I want to be free. I want to run this race to your glory and your honor, and I want to be free. I want that love. I want that joy. I want that peace. I want that victory. Is that your heart? Would you just raise your hand and say that to the Lord? God, here is my heart. I'm raising my hand because I'm asking. I want that victory. I want to run without the encumbrance. I want to run with that free heart to love you and the joy that goes with it. God, help me to run that way. Help me to live that way. Just raise your hand and say that to the Lord. God, thank you for everyone who has moved of the Spirit, touched of you, changed, transformed, because you moved on us. God, we love you and thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, and everyone said.